estimated global cost of cyber attacks now stands on $400 billion, and it's expected to grow to more than $2 trillion in only three years' time. With that in mind, what insurance protection do you have in place to cope with a potential cyber attack? Our next speaker is Mark Weil, CEO of Marsh UK and Ireland, um, and which is a global leader in uh, insurance broking and risk management. And he will be speaking about a fascinating and relatively new topic, which is intersection between cybersecurity and insurance. Please welcome Mark Weil to the stage. Thank you. Here you go. Hi, everybody. So this is a uh, journey that began for me uh, on a farm in Somerset, where I spent my weekends, when I called the head of Lloyd's. London is a fintech center. It's a cybersecurity center. It's also an insurance center, the world's leading insurance center. And I said, we have to do something about cyber insurance. And my eight-year-old son was listening. And when I finished the call, he said, uh, Dad, why do we need to insure the cider? I had to assure I meant cyber, not cider. And this is where we've got to. We now have an insurance market. The insurance market uh, in uh, the world is growing fast, as was said. I just want to make a few basic observations. You can buy the stuff. It comes in 57 different varieties because there are lots of different ways things can go wrong. It does pay. One of the rumors is it doesn't. Roughly, insurers pay out what they receive, less the cost of operating their business. They, they make more or less no money on the business of being an insurer, they make their money on the investments with the, the float, the money that they bring in. You can cover up to around half a billion or so uh, for a single risk. Uh, that's a large amount of money to bet. Uh, it's not large enough for some of the biggest firms, but it's a start, and it's growing pretty fast. Held back by the fear of aggregation, the problem you have as an insurer, I look, I think I insured this retailer. Turns out I was insuring 20 other retailers using the same software and what I thought was half a billion becomes 20 billion, and that's a problem. Uh, so how you control for the accumulation risk is a big problem. Still a bit pricey. You know, we're learning how to think about the risk, how to model it, uh, how to control it. So it's a little bit expensive compared to some other lines, but it's not, uh, not crazily so. Big in the US, driven by data breach. So that's what everybody thinks about. When they think about cyber in the US, it's about losing your data. You have mandatory disclosure, you have to tell people it happened, and you have to uh, compensate. Uh, and as has been mentioned already, uh, GDPR is coming, so that'll probably have a pretty uh, dramatic effect on European view of the risk. Another reason how, as an insurer, we don't like cyber too much is there's some pretty scary parallels to the credit crisis. You know, the credit crisis of 2007-8, uh, you had a very poorly understood risk. It turned out that credit wasn't well controlled hidden pathways in which uh, subprime in the US suddenly seemed to be manifesting in problems in banks around the world. Huge hits to reputation, big costs uh, for the recovery, but I will say relatively easy to repair. Uh, our Chancellor Philip Hammond knows that if he has a repeat, you can fix a bank in a weekend if it's had a liquidity event or a credit event. With cyber, most of that's true except the latter. If a bank systems are fried and it loses its data, it's not totally clear you can ever get it back. So that starts to feel like a pretty scary thing to, to bet on uh, recovery and to bet uh, yourself against, which is what insurers do. So where does insurance fit in? Well, you can sort of think about three broad categories of event. The low-level stuff, which is where most cyber today, as we talk about the scary stuff, the two and a half million cyber crimes reported in the UK last year were pretty petty fraud, card not present, uh, uh, ransomware, phishing attacks typically covered by the bank, because if it's a payment fraud and you're a consumer, broadly the banks will uh, compensate you. Uh, and that is not a good thing to insure, because if I know I'm going to have a billion pounds a year of fraud costs, the insurer knows it's a billion pounds a year, there's no trade-off, there's no risk, it's a certainty. And at the other extreme, if somebody's going to try and shut the system down, the kind of attack that uh, was launched upon Estonia's system, that's the sort of problem of the government. Uh, there's no private insurer who wants to take that particular risk. So it's really the stuff in the middle where the Sonys, the talk talks, where individual firms get attacked for whatever reason. Somebody wants to take the firm down. So far, I will stress, reputations have suffered. But there are very few firms you can point to where there was a default because of a cyber attack. But nevertheless, embarrassment, pretty significant costs. And with GDPR, much larger sanction costs coming in as well. That's the area that insurers like to play in. Uh, when we look at it, I will say uh, 
while more can always be done, things are happening and happening quite quickly. We do an annual survey. Cyber is now more like 60% in the top 10 risks. Only a year ago, it was about 30%. Most firms, certainly large firms, are trying to do stuff. What they're doing is more questionable in terms of the quantification, the multidisciplinary teams, the way they're approaching it. But they are trying to do stuff. And what I'll say is, in the end, if you're running a firm, I'm both a provider of cyber cover, but also I have a, my own cyber risk to worry about, is what you spend. You look outside in that hall, our previous speaker, there's some fantastic technologies, but there's an awful lot of them, and each one of them is going to cost, and it starts to accumulate into you know, a long queue of people outside my door saying, if you don't buy this thing, then you're at risk. And that is a real problem. So where do I stop? When's enough enough? Uh, and some of the attacks that have got through are some pretty basic things that were missing in the defenses. And that is where insurance comes in. I won't, I won't do the exam question for you of why buy insurance, but I'm guessing most of you, when you buy insurance for your car, your house, or for other purposes, are thinking it's what we call risk transfer. You want some money. If something goes wrong, you get paid. And risk transfer, it basically deepens your pockets. You pay your 10 pounds a month, or whatever it may be, knowing that you can get a million pounds back if the, the house burns down. Uh, if you're in business, you can also see it as a way of lowering your cost of capital. Third parties' capital might be cheaper than yours, so you could fund it yourself, but actually uh, an insurer is a better way to do it. But it provides two other things. It provides financial discipline, and it provides risk insight. The financial discipline is that I'm going to bet money on you being safe, so I'm going to put you through some pretty difficult questions and tests to make sure you've got it right. And in doing that, I can make some comparisons to how other firms do things. So those things, I think, are much more important for businesses than the deep pockets point. Nobody really wants a cyber attack to get through. So if insurance can play a role here, I think it's primarily as helping you make sure you're doing things right to avoid the problem in the first place. And to show you, I'm not going to go through the details, the sort of things we do, you look at scenarios. So a typical client, 50, 60 ways in which it can go wrong, and you start to look at uh, what that does to different aspects of the firm to stress test the business. You look at financial implications, capital models of you know, probabilities of events getting through and what they might do to the balance sheet. Cash flow under stress, if that cyber crunch happens, probably you're going to find it difficult to trade. You've got what we call a business interruption to get through. So you want to know whether you can trade through it and have you got the financial resources in place. And of course, in doing this, you can model the effect of some of that software, some of that technology, some of the preparations to see whether they're going to be worth the money, whether they're going to have the effect you hope. You can do things like risk benchmarking. We have a tool we use which scoops information from the dark, deep web, uh, which looks at IP addresses and handshakes and says how you compare on your risk. And we can also look at the control environment and whether those procedures look solid. So these are the kind of things you do before you bet money on a firm being safe. But in doing that bet, you actually shine a little light for the firm on whether they're doing the right things and uh, how risky they really are. Because one of the challenges for a board is knowing what is it you do uh, and have you got it right. And so some of those risk insights are things like, you know, we, some of the statistics already quoted, human error is critical. How is risk being governed? So when we look at the insurance opportunity, we encourage clients towards a multidisciplinary approach to managing this like every other risk, rather than it being the domain of the uh, IT department. And as a final observation, the role of insurance is important around the supply chain. Most firms have tons of suppliers and lots of customers. And the question is, what are the risks they present, and indeed the opportunities? So on the supplier side, we're typically thinking about the risks they can bring and insisting that they go through a similar exercise and are similarly insured against a failure to supply. And on the customer side, there's a question of whether you can provide advantage to them using insurance. So if you're offering services, many of you may well be doing that, you want to be able to guarantee those services work. Well, one way to do that is to weave insurance into it. So there's a backstop that says, if we can't get you back up and running in 48 hours, there's a financial consequence as a guarantee that gives you some comfort. So those are kind of other ways in which we're sort of using insurance to help our clients manage the risk, their suppliers and their customers. Thank you.